come here to the second section of the process data, which is the graphs. The graph is also the place where I find the most mistakes of the process section. So the graphs here, there are some important things that you need to know. The first and the most important thing is never ever graph your raw data. Your raw data stays on the raw data section, okay? What exactly are you graphing? You're graphing your process data. I have seen a lot of students lose points because they're using the raw data into the graphs. No. What are the things that you'll be graphing? You'll be the average, the standard deviation with the standard errors. These are the stuff that you're going to be graphing. The average is the most important part. Do not do it because you will lose a lot of points out of this. Now, what are the things that must include in your graph? One of the first things that you must include is a title and a specific and a full one. That means the here, for example, the effect of temperature on the average amount of sweat release and scan. So you're telling me the independent and the dependent, just like you did with the tables on the raw and the process data. Make sure you have a title to your graph. Do not put this versus that, temperature versus growth. That's middle school titles, guys. You have to be specific. The effect of temperature on the growth rate of a certain plant. The effect of enzyme lipase on the rate of whatever it is of another animal, whatever it is. You have to be in full sentence, your titles. Also, what are you going to do? The X and Ys. Remember that the X is always on the bottom. I mean, I mean, the bottom is usually the ones that are going to be your independent variables and the Ys will be your dependent variables. So what examples of independent variables that you put in the bottom? It can be time, it can be temperature, and the Ys will be the dependent variables. It can be your mass, the growth, the rate of reaction, whatever it is, the speed here. So you have to mention that you have to put always the X as the independent and the Y as dependent. That helps you a lot. Also, when you're going to do the X's and the Y's, make sure you have the name, the unit, and the uncertainty. I know that there's sometimes that the dependent will not have a certain unit or the independent won't have it. That's totally okay. But it's important that you put the unit and the uncertainty in those X's and Y's because this is where we also find points to take it off. So anything under that doesn't have unit uncertainties, titles, and full titles for the things, you lose points. And obviously, in the end, you need to have a paragraph under your graphs. Just putting the graphs is not enough. You need to have a paragraph under it, explaining, analyzing the data that you got. So here, for example, is a sample of it. Let's look at the sample for you to clearly understand what I'm talking about. So the first and most important thing here is there is a title. See, it says effect of temperature on ketchup breakdown by... So there's a full title telling you the independent and the dependent. Now let's look at the X. The X, you have the title, which is temperature. You have the unit and the uncertainty. Again, the name, the unit, the uncertainty. And then on the Y, which is a dependent variable, you have the name, the unit, and the uncertainty. If you keep those, you don't lose points. And then, of course, you plug the graph. Usually, these graphs will have to have error bars or they can have trend lines depending, of course, on whatever it is your lab about. Now, under it is where you get the graph, and this is where students have a hard time explaining. What are you telling them in the graph? You're telling them a trend. Is there a positive correlation, which means if one increases, the other one is decreasing, or is a negative correlation? One is increasing, and the other is decreasing, increasing, whatever it is, inverse proportional, whatever is the relationship, you have to explain that. As you can see, as the temperature increases, you can see that the weight is dropping. Explain that. And then talk about the statistical value about this. As you can see here, look, due to the large standard deviation shows that the error bars as, as well as the similarity in results of these guys, the correlation is not highly significant. So you can see that they're saying that the bars are very big, which that means they're almost the same. And you're like, wait, I don't care what you're saying. This is how it works. Here is the trick. So you want to know if the values are significantly, and you have to use that word, significantly different or not significantly different. Or even better, statistically significant different, statistically not significant different. That word kills when you go and write that on your paragraph. So but how would you know which one is it? Look at the error bars. So right here, you see these error bars? They are connecting, they are crossing, that means they cross their path, which that means their data is almost the same. 
So that means there is no statistical difference between them. These guys, the bottom of one is touching the top of the other one. That means they still cross each other. So they still are not statistically significantly different. Now look at this guy. They do not touch each other. Because the error bars do not touch at them, that means that their points are different from each other, which means statistically they are significantly different. And that's something that you need to write on your on your graph right under it, because that happens. That's why I tell you error bars are very important in your graph, okay? So common graphs to use. Now, this is just examples of some graphs, because I know some students says, which ones to use? Well, when you have distant groups, like here, you have white, red, and yellow, of course, the bars are better for that one. But remember, you have to put the error bars, you have to put the X and the Ys, and you have to have a title. Make sure you have that. Line graphs. Line graphs are very best when you have the x-axis as time. It helps because you can see the growth is happening or the decrease is happening as time goes by. So that's how I will use the line graphs for whenever you're working with time, okay? Making sure again that the time is on the x-axis. Bars, a bars will be when you're trying to compare groups. So if you have one group doing something, one group is doing the other, then bars are the best one. But remember, in the bars, you also have to have error bars. Now, here we have a scare plot. That means you have different points in there. That's when you're going to use a best fit line. Now, barely see this happening in bio. This is more finding in physics or chemistry. But again, just remember that if you're doing scare plot, that means you have plots all over the place. That means different values from different places. Then you have to get the best fit line for it. Pie chart. I only see pie chart when we're talking about uh, genetics. When you're doing the Punnett squares, then you can say... 50% is PP and, I don't know, 20 out of 5% is the big P or the small P. That kind of things would use the pie charts. But I barely see it happen. Then you have the histogram. The histogram is the frequencies. Like, how, like here it says at the age of 4, how many of them have the value high up there. Uh, the age of 6. So this is just saying how much frequently you see on something. So histogram is more, let's say, how many leaves are blue, how many leaves are red, what's the frequency, that's what the frequency is, how many numbers you see of that. Histogram will work for that. Now out of the histogram, you can have those big bars showing up, or you can have just the connections of the average values and use it as a line. So there's not much difference between these two graphs here, but again, this is all about frequency, that means how much you see of a certain species, or how much you see of a certain height or a certain weight. Now that's what would be a graph on histogram. Now what are the most common graphs that I see when it comes to bio is the line graph as well as the bar graph. These are the most common ones. Remember that if you're going to do comparison between two groups, again, I will repeat this, use the bar graphs. If you're going to do according to time, it has to be line. Do not use bar graphs when the x-axis is about the time. You will get points off. So this is it for the whole uh, data analysis actions. We did talk about the raw data, the quantitative, the qualitative, using the right words and the units and uncertainties and all this. And we did also the process data, which is all the calculations and the graph. If you follow these instructions, there's no chances that you're gonna get any points on these section. So once again, we're done with the data analysis and now we're gonna to go to the evaluation and the conclusion and tell you what are the things that you need to write there. So remember with Nail B, you can get that seven, just follow through and I see you on the next video.